This is WWE superstar Drew McIntyre, and you're listening to the WWE Podcast. One that everybody wants me. Austin three sixteen says I just ripped your ass. This is my iron. You're gonna acknowledge me. All right, everybody, guys and girls, welcome back to another edition of the SmackDown Review with Mike and John, right here on the WWE Podcast. As always, I'm one of the hosts here, Michael Ritter. You can find me on Twitter at Michael Five Ritter. And on Instagram at Michael Ritter 5 also the host of the Football Function Podcast. Joining me on today's episode, obviously, the review of the SmackDown that aired on February 25th, 2022 from Hershey, Pennsylvania. John Carrasco. John, how you doing, bud? I'm doing pretty good, man. This was an exciting show, so yeah, I'm definitely ready to get into it. It was. I honestly, like I told you off air, I also said it in the Discord server. This felt like a go home show. It did. And what I mean by that is just like the excitement, especially like a contract signing. Normally that's something that they save for much later or much closer to the actual event. So the fact that it's what, like five weeks away or something like that, it's definitely quite mm-hmm. a ways for WrestleMania. There's still like a, a little bit of an event b- between now and then that was announced on Raw. There's going to be like some glorified house show, a live event in Madison Square Garden. Where Brock Lesnar is going to have to defend his WWE World Heavyweight Championship against, I don't even know who. Did you catch who, or is it still undecided there? Is it Bobby Lashley? Undecided. I don't, yeah, so it's still up in there. If Lashley's healthy, it would make sense to give him that opportunity. Seth Rollins, another guy who I think maybe would make it exciting there, but who knows? There's definitely some worthy opponents for Brock Lesnar over on the Raw side, but really quickly, before we get in, to the actual SmackDown review, there was some news that happened a little bit earlier today. And number one, well, before we get into the news that happened today, before we do that, rewind a little bit, backtrack a couple of days. Cesaro quietly leaves the company. He's no longer a member of WWE. kind of sucks. We didn't get a chance to have that, like, ooh, this is going to be his farewell match. I didn't even know his contract, contract was expiring, and out of nowhere, he's gone. So what do you think about this? Were you a fan of Cesaro? Are you going to miss him? Do you think he's going to land in AEW? What are your thoughts on this uh, transaction that WWE made? I wasn't a fan of it, man. I felt like Cesaro kind of brought like a lot to the table, even though he was like really like lowly played, I guess you could say. But yeah, man, I wasn't a fan of it, especially whenever I saw that they had gave AJ Styles like a good pay cut. I mean, not a good pay cut, but pay extension. Raise. Yeah. Or, yeah, whatever you want to call it. But, yeah, I was like, man, you know, older guy, give the, you know, I guess you could say younger guy a little bit, you know, leveling up and stuff like that. Give him a chance, you know, instead of just let it, letting him go to a whole another brand and stuff like that. So, I, yeah, I wasn't a fan of it. I wasn't either. Cesaro was definitely one of the – you want to talk about fumbling the bag or just mishandling the situation? That's like that's it. the perfect example right there. Cesaro is one of the most talented dudes. He's been known as like the pound for pound strongest guy on the roster for so long. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna miss those signature Cesaro swings. I will say oh, now yeah. that we know we're not gonna see those anymore. Kind of just you never know. I mean, the last one we didn't even know it was the last one, and that's kind of I guess just how life works. But I mean, definitely gonna miss Cesaro. Obviously, want to wish him the best in all of his future endeavors, like WWE likes to say. But I think he's gonna land on his feet. Hopefully, in AEW. And hopefully it'll be a situation that he ends up thriving over there. But anyways, the news that I was actually referring to a little bit earlier, the news that happened today, today whenever we're recording this, that is, but it's the championship match at WrestleMania that we talked about that was initially just going to be winner take all. Kind of like Becky Lynch a couple of years ago where she has the Raw Women's Championship and the SmackDown Women's Championship. So it's kind of like Becky two belts. Well, maybe we'd have like Roman two belts or Brock two belts. That's kind of what I thought was going to happen, but... Today we find out that they're actually planning on unifying those championships. Now, you know what that means. For anybody who doesn't know what that means, it's kind of been speculated, kind of been feared for people like me who don't want to see this happen. But unifying the championships means kind of like what they did back in the day, whenever they had the WWE Championship and the World Heavyweight Championship. I think it might have been like 2012 or 13, whenever it happened. But they unified those championships and made them one, the WWE World Heavyweight Championship, which basically still stands today. It's the championship that Brock Lesnar actually holds. But at one point, 
they were separate, the WWE and the World Heavyweight Championship, but they unified them and they made that one WWE World Heavyweight Championship when there wasn't a brand split. Now, that's whenever it makes sense to do this, when there's not a brand split and you only have one show. So I think the writing's on the wall where there's smoke, there's fire. You can kiss this brand split goodbye. Like I said, I mean, them going to white ropes full time for the past few months, people thought I was crazy for noticing it every single week and kind of complaining about it. Now you see you kind of, and I know that the ropes aren't all like that you can kind of look at to, to see what they're doing here, but clearly unifying the championship, there's not going to be one main title for the men. Obviously we're going to have the intercontinental, going to have the United States. So maybe one positive. The mid card might be a little bit more interesting, more faces, more matchups, fresh matchups, you could say. But I think it's definitely going to hurt the company. It's so beneficial to have two brands, two strong brands, two top champions. I always t- talk back to the Ruthless Aggression era back whenever it was JBL and Triple H. You had two top heels at the top of their game just waiting for a babyface, a, I guess a, a worthy babyface to kind of push them. And knock them off and take that championship, coincidentally at WrestleMania, but it doesn't always have to happen there. But basically what I'm trying to say is having an established heel, an established top champion over on that brand for guys like John Cena, young John Cena, young Batista, young Randy Orton, even established veterans who just haven't gotten a chance yet, like a Chris Benoit back in the day. It happens. You kind of mentioned earlier, Kofi Kingston. People win their first championship late in their career. It happens all the time. But those opportunities are going to be a lot less few and far between whenever there's only one championship and it just kind of sucks you're going to see a lot of the same matchups like having two brands gives you two rosters more people get exposure so it's just i mean i I would love for somebody to try to argue the positives to this the positives to getting rid of this i think maybe honestly this is just kind of like a little bit of like a i guess pulling this out of my you know what a little thought that i had the other day is they're kind of seeing what AEW has. They don't have two rosters. They have one roster that just kind of features them on Dynamite and Rampage with one top championship, the AEW championship, if I'm not mistaken. And then they have the T or TNT championship and so on and so forth. But I think WWE wants to, I guess, copy their model. That's just, you know, like I said, there's no like merit or no sources do anything to this. I'm just, you know, some random guy who's thinking about this and it's kind of just connecting dots a little bit. And I think maybe they want to compete with AEW like that, go for the same type of model and have one solid roster and just go from there. So you could feature your top guys. And I think that maybe they're not competent enough to have two writing staff to produce two good shows. We'll see if they can even produce one good show. But uh, anyways, I guess that's kind of just my problem there. I kind of wanted to get that out of the way here before we get into the show because I know it's going to come up whenever we have this contract signing in the main event whenever they refer to it. As the unification match, Paul Heyman says it. I just saw the look on Roman Reigns' face. I was absolutely devastated, but I mean, I guess that's a good thing. You want to feel something when you watch wrestling. It's not like I'm sitting there, you know, just not paying attention at all. Like, I was legitimately kind of pissed off. I was like, man, are you kidding me? They're really going to do this? It's not good for the company, but I guess a long-winded response or a long-winded explanation there is I'm not a fan of the unification. Uh, If I wasn't clear enough there, what do you think about it? Oh, I mean, since I've been watching, man, I mean, with the draft and everything like that, it's, I don't know, it just feels kind of like more of a natural thing now, you know, just because everything, you know, you, you see superstars on both brands, you know, a lot. But yeah, I mean, I'm I'm kind of getting used to it and everything, so I mean, I don't know, I, I, I'm okay with one belt, I guess you could say, but... Yeah, I, I'm kind of with the like one one belt on one end, one belt on the other end, just because, like you said, I, it kind of brings like some more attention to like a lot more of the stars and stuff like that instead of just like being circled around certain ones. So yeah, I'm I'm, I'm kind of with both sides of it, I guess you could say, just depending on how the story like folds out and stuff like that. So does that mean that the Universal Championships is going to go away? I mean, I just bought that freaking belt to have here hanging up on my <laughs> wall. You know that. So, I mean, is that going to no longer be a thing? I finally got the Blue Universal Championship. I love that thing. Like I told you, though, I mean, I don't know what they're going to do, how they're going to unify them. Hopefully they have a plan. The only way I would get behind this and say, all right, it's worth it. I'm behind it is if they bring back the World Heavyweight Championship. Uh, I've said it multiple times. Randy Orton. You see Randy Orton. He's a well-respected current WWE wrestler who's under contract with the company right now. Go ask him his resume. 
You know what he's going to say? He's going to say, I'm a 14-time world heavyweight champion. He's not going to say I'm a 14-time WWE champion. He's not going to say I'm a 14-time universal champion. He still refers to himself as a 14-time world heavyweight champion because he knows what the real deal is. He knows where the big boys play. He knows where the actual championship or which actual championship matters, the one with all the gold. None of these little fancy little markings on him, all these little cool designs. Just simply solid gold. Ric Flair had it. All these superstars had it. Triple H, like I've mentioned several times, made this championship famous. If they bring that championship back, sign me up. All right, cool. You know, I'll sign up for getting rid of the brand split, and I'll have a little bit of, I guess you can say, consolation prize. But if not, if they're just going to come up with some other championship, like they're going to call it the new WWE Galactic Championship or something like that, then I'm going to have a little bit of a problem with it. They need to keep it true to the history keep it you know these prestigious championships and uh i'll be all for it but if they're just going to create another championship out of the blue then i mean come on i really i don't know the direction they're going here but anyways i guess that's just kind of what i wanted to open the show with right there are you ready to kind of dive in here to the the episode of smackdown which is why all these people are here today oh yeah i'm definitely ready for this man it was exciting from the show from start to finish man I, i'm with it well, this show actually starts with Pat McAfee on the mic. That's whose voice you hear kind of opening the show. Why? Because Michael Cole is standing in the ring, and he's introducing the winner of the Women's Royal Rumble match, Ronda Rousey. So she comes out, and Michael Cole asks her why she returned at the Royal Rumble, specifically there. Like if she wanted to do it like strategically or if it just kind of worked out like that, like coincidentally. And she responds by kind of crediting her mother and the accomplishments that she's made despite being a single mother. And Ronda Rousey wanted to do that, kind of come back and set a good example for her daughter, kind of like what her mother did for her. Do it, you know, keep the generations flowing. You know what I'm talking about here. Ronda Rousey wanted to set a good example for her daughter. So that's why she decided to come back so she can go back, watch on the WWE Network or Peacock years now, whenever she's actually old enough to remember and see what her mother accomplished to say, hey, four months after I delivered or I gave birth to you, I was back in the ring kicking ass, main eventing WrestleMania. So shout out to Ronda Rousey. It's definitely one thing that uh, she's going to be able to add to her long list of accomplishments. And speaking of that long list of accomplishments, Michael Cole actually starts to list it off. But Ronda Rousey cuts him off, and she says that she's not really concerned with the past. She's more so focused on right now and what her new goals are. One of them in particular, she wants to be the first person to tap out Charlotte Flair, and I didn't know that that hadn't been done yet. I could have swore that somebody at some point had made Charlotte Flair tap out. I mean, I guess that I can't remember something off the top of my head. I can't think of a very specific time when that happened, so I'll just have to take her word for it. But Charlotte Flair does come out, and she claims that she took it easy on Ronda Rousey at the Elimination Chamber because Ronda had one arm time behind her back. So she was basically trying to play it a little bit nice. She didn't want to expose Ronda Rousey. That's what Charlotte Flair was trying to pitch there. You could believe it if you want to, but obviously Ronda Rousey just uh, wasn't really having it. But Charlotte says that she promises that she's going to make Ronda Rousey tap out at Mania well. So one of these ladies is going to tap out. They both predicted it. They both went out on a limb and said, I'm going to make the other person tap out. But I don't know who is actually going to succeed there. My money's probably going to be on Ronda Rousey. But Ronda is actually attacked by Sonya Deville from behind. So what do you think about this? Sonya got a little bit of shots in there, a little bit more than what I expected. Still didn't get the upper hand. As soon as Ronda Rousey flipped her over and kind of turned the tables, Sonya makes a run for it like she's known to do. But what do you think about this opening segment? Uh, it was definitely good, man. Like uh, anytime you know, like, you know me, I'm Ronda hater for sure. So anytime seeing Ron- uh, Ronda getting anything happen to her, I'm I'm all for it. And plus with this uh, Sonya and Charlotte thing, man, I kind of like their little duo, you know. I, I don't, really, don't really like how they're, like, pushing it in a different direction now. So, I mean, yeah, it's just starting to fall off on an uh, end that I don't want to see. But, I mean, I'm all for it. I mean, this is interesting to me. It is a little bit of an interesting dynamic when you think about it. Someone who's capable of beating any woman on the roster. She has the credibility, the credentials when you look at her resume. Obviously, coming from a, a family like Ric Flair, people talk about how she had everything handed to her anyway. So you could give somebody like that a crooked authority member like Sonya Deville in her back pocket. 
you could tell that that's going to set up for a, a nice little dynamic, kind of like what you mentioned. But having an authority figure in your back pocket, a crooked authority figure, so to speak, will come back to bite you in the ass. And we'll kind of talk about that by moving on to the next segment where Adam Pierce basically calls her out for it. He says, look, he, he's sitting there there in front of a monitor. He's showing her the highlights from that opening segment for attacking Ronda Rousey. And he says, look, you can't be doing this. You can't be attacking the top talent like this. I just got off the phone with upper management. You're going to have to go one-on-one with Ronda Rousey next week, and that match is official. One thing i got a problem with here is, so is it just uh, Ronda Rousey? Like, is, is that the one who's, like, off limits for Adam Pierce that you can't touch? Last time I checked, Sonya Deville was absolutely a thorn in Naomi's ass for, like, six months, completely breaking the rules. But upper management just kind of, you know, was sitting there twiddling their thumbs, not really paying attention to SmackDown, I guess. I don't really know what the situation was, but... As soon as she starts to cheap shot Ronda Rousey, nope. She already got one match on Elimination Chamber, and now she's going to get another one. So that's a little bit – uh doesn't quite add up there, but it is what it is. But that's pretty much all that happened in that little segment is she got called out. Adam Pierce clearly is pissed off at her, and upper management is as well. So she's going to have to pay for it by going one-on-one with Ronda Rousey. Are you looking forward to that match? I know you're not a Rousey fan, but she's definitely going to be the favorite in this one. Oh, yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to this, man. Um, I feel like it's good for both of them just because, like, I guess they're coming back to the to the ringing, you know. I don't know, more of full-time, but I don't know. It kind of just helped both of their characters just because, you know, they've had a good break, you know. And I don't know. I think they'll just build off of each other and build some uh, chemistry and momentum going forward. I agree, no doubt about it, but let's go ahead and get on to another match here. I guess the first match of the actual show, Los Lotharios versus Big E. This is actually the rubber match, the tiebreaker, if you will. Both of these teams each have one win on each other, so I was interested just on on that standpoint alone. I was like, hell yeah, let's do this, prove which one of these two teams is better. Big E and Kofi actually come out on a four-wheeler, though. I couldn't help but think about Stone Cold Steve Austin, whenever he was Sheriff Austin, mm-hmm. if you go back, like I know you plan on doing and watching the Ruthless Aggression era, specifically Monday Night Raw, whenever he was the co-general manager, the sheriff, quote unquote, he came out on a four-wheeler every single night, he ran around the ring, get beer cans, clack them together. I mean, it's it's great stuff. I promise you will just yeah. you'll be a kid all over again. But that's kind of where I was <laughs> seeing them come out on this uh, on this four-wheeler here. But New Day does nearly win this match with a midnight hour, but Humberto Carrillo, he breaks up the pinfall, and the match continues on. One thing I wrote down here in my notes, there was an ugly suicide dive that Angel Garza landed on Kofi Kingston. He kind of just dove out the top of his head, hit Kofi right in the face, and it looked like that that impact right there was bothering Kofi even after the match. Whenever they won, he was standing on the top turnbuckles, kind of still you know, favoring his face a little bit. And even uh, my girlfriend Ashley, she was kind of sitting there watching the show. And she noticed that. She's actually the one that pointed out and said, you might want to rewind that because that was a little bit of a collision there. But anyways, Angel Garza has Kofi Kingston right where he wants him in prime position to hit like a splash type move whenever he's on the top rope. But Big E distracts him by acting like he's going to run over Humberto Carrillo outside the ring with that ATV. And then uh, obviously the tables turn after Kofi gets momentum. Kofi hits the midnight hour once again, but this time it's enough to get the win. Big E looked great in this match. I did think it was overall a pretty good one, time-consuming for sure. But all in all, decent match here. The New Day or Big E and Kofi, whatever you want to call them, they get the win. So I guess two to one there on Los Lotharios. Yeah, man, but this one wasn't a bad match at all. I mean, I felt like uh, Big E, he had like a little bit more energy. I know I had said last week that he felt like he was, or I felt like he was kind of like wasn't present. But yeah, I felt like he was like more more active in this one, but. I wasn't able really to pay attention much of this. I mean, it was like a lunchable for me. I had some situations going on at the house, so yeah, yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't catch much of it. But the ATV thing, I mean, it, it was pretty cool. I did, thought he was gonna kind of do like a little bit more of a, I don't know, like a teaser, get closer up to uh, Humberto at the bottom of the ring, stuff like that. But I mean, I don't know, man. I, I just didn't have too much for it. What about the Sam Roberts interview that happened after this match backstage with the Usos whenever they were kind of just hyping up that contract signing and then the Viking Raiders come up, attack them, say they're ready for their championship match, which was announced, going to be happening next week. But did this interview do anything for you, the fact that they got attacked, uh, cheap shotted, or are you ready to move on to the next one? I mean, this one's pretty, I mean, it's keeping, like, 
my interest there, you know, because last time it was the Usos getting them. Now it's the Viking Raiders, Raiders getting the Usos. So it's like a good back and forth feud that's definitely keeping me interested. So since we're not going to talk before that match, ne- the next time we're going to be here on the show, it's going to be after that SmackDown. Who's your pick to win that? Do you think the Usos are going to retain, go into WrestleMania as the SmackDown Tag Team Champions? Oh, yeah, I'm riding for the Usos all the way. We the ones, baby. We the ones. All right. For sure. I'm with you there. Yeah. I'm with you there. You and your uh, your NWO Wolfpack shirt. I will say the listeners can't see it, oh, but that's God. a nice shirt you got on there. Yes, sir. I had to go and get me one just because I got to represent. Got to represent. But hey, I'm with you there. Yeah, go ahead. That, continue on. Yeah, uh, continue. I was going to say, did you happen to catch that little – I don't even know if it was like a commercial with Rick Boogs and Shinsuke with that Tacoma or whatever they were driving in? I fast forward to the commercial, so if it oh, was gosh, one, I dude. probably missed it. <clears throat> this is just something I was wondering. Like, y'all had all this freaking time to record this dang commercial or whatever it is, but you can't freaking go practice to contend for your IC t- title and stuff like that. I was just like, come on, man. I wasn't with that part. I was like, well, why even advertise that? What kind of sponsorship was that? Like, I ain't going to go yeah. by that trip for sure. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, definitely. They probably picked the wrong guys, I'll tell you that, especially if they were. Yeah, wanna... I was going to say, yeah, go go look. Just go check it out whenever you have extra time. Just, yeah, I don't know. I thought it was just weird. I got you. Speaking of weird, we'll talk about this Zia Lee versus Natalia match. Just when you talk about Zia Lee's whole approach, I guess you can say, to this thing. I mean, the whole superhero protector thing, I'm not with it. I'm really not, honestly. I think that she's good enough in the ring to kind of transfer over a little bit of that NXT character. I mean... I didn't watch a whole lot of NXT, but I know that she that this is different. Like she was more so like a hill, if I'm not mistaken. Like there, she was like in a little bit of a, a little bit of a group. There was a guy there who uh, who I'm trying to think. He wore like a suit. He did all types of like martial arts moves. But anyways, I feel like she'd be good like that in, in that type of heel role. But more so, I guess there is enough heels on SmackDown already. When you look at like Shotzi Blackheart, kind of still somewhat somehow being a heel for whatever reason she was pissed off about sasha banks for interfering in a match with her and charlotte and she turned heel when she still had her tank and out of nowhere i mean she's never she's been pissed off ever since it's been like six months it's time to get over it but anyways xia uh i guess that's really the only thing i would tweak about it in ring she did she looked great against natalia this was a match that i mean clearly i was 100 percent sure she was going to win if they would have made her lose her very first match on the main roster would have been absolutely crazy, but I want to see more of her. It's hard for me to get behind this character when you only see it once every three weeks. You know, whenever whenever you do, it's most of the time it's like the uh, the special effects on the TV. If you're in the arena and you see her come out, it looks weird because she's out there doing that, you know, hitting the air. So definitely she's more of like a TV production type of visual, I guess, you know, more than – Somebody sitting there front row just watching her do her kung fu moves and all that stuff, you know. But anyways, she gets the win here pretty decisively. I will say shout out to Zia Lee. She's actually the first Chinese competitor in the WWE. I didn't realize that. I figured that there had at least been one before in the past, but she is the first. So definitely shout out to her. I'm sure she's happy about that, being able to, you know, represent her native country and be the very first one to ever do that. So. She does win with a brutal spinning heel kick. Did you see that? The way she ended this match and yes. she just like kicked Natalia's head off. I rewinded that just because it was so beautiful. That was vintage right there. Just absolutely knocked her head off. If you've seen anybody nail one of those spinning heel kicks, Alistair Black. He's someone who used to do this on a weekly basis called the Black Mass. So I'm all for Zia Lee doing this. Like I said, I just want to see more of her. I don't want to absolutely rule out her character. But it's just really tough right now because she says she's the defender. But you're you're amongst professional wrestlers, like you know, top flight athletes. Like, who are you going to be protecting over here? Maybe <laughs> Dominic over on Raw. Dominic might need a little bit of protection. You can go over there, but I don't know. This uh, other than that, I think her character might just need a little bit more exposure. Small tweaks, get rid of these special effects, and I think she's going to be ready to roll. Oh yeah, with this one, man, I just felt like like well, Natalia being like the person that she is, and then like for her to be. I guess you could say like mentoring Zaylee and Aaliyah. I feel like it's kind of good for him just because like given just like the background that Natalia has and everything like that. So I feel like it's a good, good, good for, for all three of them, I guess you could say in a way. But um, 
I don't know. I think we could kind of move on for, from it already, you know, kind of give, like you were saying, Zia Lee, like a bigger role instead of the, like this little background type thing. But I don't know, man. Yeah, we just got to see more of her, I guess you could say. I think we will. The more or the closer we get to Mania, especially after Mania, whenever they like to experiment with, experiment with people. One name I mentioned, you said you really weren't familiar with her, Lacey Evans. She's the prime example right yeah. after Mania. She kind of got a little bit of a push. And she got to get the rub from Becky Lynch right after Becky Lynch was coming off that huge Becky two belts run or whatever it was. Or I guess okay. as soon as she won the championships. So pay attention then. I guess maybe Zia Lee might get a little bit more airtime and more exposure around then. But we can go ahead and move on here to Sami Zayn, your favorite, in his Intercontinental Championship mm-hmm. celebration. And he starts this by saying that justice is served and he demands that the crowd shows him some respect. And then he also says that he's willing to give Shinsuke Nakamura his rematch for the Intercontinental title, but Shinsuke is still picking up pieces from his kneecap that apparently Sami Zayn shattered, so might not see Shinsuke anytime soon unless you do watch the commercials, in which case you might see him make an appearance there, but not going to see him on WWE TV in the upcoming future if that kneecap is, in fact, injured like that. But because Shinsuke is not available, Sami says that he's going to defend it against quote-unquote any and all comers. And out comes Johnny Knoxville. And Johnny Knoxville, as you'd expect, challenges him for the title. And Sami says no because Knoxville just doesn't belong there simply is what Sami Zayn said. And then Johnny or Johnny Knoxville pulls out the old no balls card and basically <laughs> just likes to uh, poke Sami Zayn and try to just antagonize him to make him do it. And then he actually says, don't you want to be a fighting champion? And that's kind of like a running joke here on the WWE podcast is the baby faces. They always claim once they win the championship, they'll come out on Raw or SmackDown and they'll, you know, declare that they're going to be a fighting champion and they're going to give people opportunities. If you want a chance at the championship, come, you know, come one, come all, I'll give you the opportunity. And that's just kind of something that we kind of laugh at, you know, because, well, Sheamus, he's one person who didn't do that. He, Whenever he won the United States Championship, he was very clear, I'm not going to defend this against anybody. You're going to have to earn this. And this was way back after WrestleMania last year, so I'm not really sure if you got to see that, but that's just kind of like an, another example whenever they don't do it. But here, whenever like these championships, like the Intercontinental, doesn't get defended in so long, I guess I kind of – I miss those days with the fighting champion where they would actually be willing to defend their championship because whenever a title just gets put up or put on the shelf for months or weeks on end, it's definitely not fun. But anyways – Sami Zayn cheap shots Johnny Knoxville and then takes him out with a couple haluva kicks, knocking his head off damn near. But this leads me to ask you a question. I think it's all but official. The writing's on the wall. Where there is smoke, there is fire. Are you ready for a Sami Zayn versus Johnny Knoxville match at WrestleMania for the Intercontinental Championship? Uh, I mean, I, I, I could happening? say yeah. Yeah, I could say yeah just because it's more of like the – like comedy for this show you know i guess you could say because like i don't really take sammy too serious with this belt i mean i felt like yeah he fought for it, i guess you could say but it was just kind of a, a easy win you know so just quick transition you know kind of give some new spice to life and everything like that but i mean just look at how he came out today you know he was all dressed up in like this little suit you know like flashy and stuff like that like to me it looked like he was more like oh i'm gonna go present this instead of you know like oh i'm the person that's actually holding this title so i mean i'm ready for it i feel like johnny can come in you know kind of you know do his role give like everybody their little laugh and everything like that so yeah i'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to, towards this one. Oh yeah definitely but i just it's going to be weird. I mean, oh, yeah, and I will say, this is kind of like a little – I keep forgetting to mention this. And so what I was about to say is I'm excited to see Johnny Knoxville in person, live. I'm going to go mm. to WrestleMania this year. I will be in person my first, maybe last. We'll see kind of what happens. Life is kind of crazy the way things happen, so you never know what's going to happen down the road. But right now, where we stand, 2022, Dallas, Texas, AT&T Stadium, I will be there attending my very first wrestlemania i will be there for night one and night two so shout out to mr casual wrestling fan for plugging those tickets because that's actually whenever i said you know what i'm gonna go take a little bit of a peek here and i did 
found some. It's good to go. We are going to be there. WWE podcast will be represented. The SmackDown review will be represented in Dallas, Texas for WrestleMania night one, night two. So I just kind of wanted to get that out of the way there. I am excited to see uh, all the matchups there. So now I am 100% on board praying for Stone Cold Steve Austin to come back because I need to see Stone Cold Steve Austin. Need to see it. I was going to say, man, you need to make you a little sign or something like that. Give yourself a little promotion out there while you're there, you know? For sure. E- even if it doesn't get on TV, my section, everybody that walks past oh, me, yeah. somebody will see it. You know, there's going to be a, a lot of people. If I could say a different adjective or a different word to describe how many people there that was, you know, involved a couple cuss words, I would, but I can't. So <laughs> basically, I mean, there will be quite a bit of people. To say the least. I mean, you have a, you know, two, I mean, a good two days, you know, so I mean, I'm pretty sure you'll get a good ca- camera angle one of those times that you're there. We'll see. We'll see about that. But anyways, we can go ahead and move on here. Sasha Banks, boss time, made her return to SmackDown here. We haven't seen her since the – was it the Royal Rumble? I don't really know when the last time we saw Sasha. Actually, now that I think yeah. about it, but she went one-on-one with Shotzi. Yeah. She uh, makes her tap out with the bank statement after she hits a new move. It looked like it's not like the backstabber; it's more like a face stabber. Or she pulls their the opponent's head down on her knees instead of their back. Look brutal. After that, she makes her tap out, and then Naomi comes out, who was kind of there on commentary with Pat McAfee and Michael Cole. She gets in the ring and she declares that you're looking at the next women's tag team champions. So, I mean, yeah, Sasha Banks. The Sasha Banks, one of the best women's wrestlers on the roster right now, arguably the best actual wrestler on the roster right now, is going to be in a program for the Tag Team Championships. Are are you kidding me? The Tag Team Championships that you didn't even know were on anybody whenever you asked me. I didn't know either. If I wouldn't have watched Raw for the first time in two months today, that's a title that we never see on SmackDown, the Tag Team Championships. We never see the 24-7 Championship on SmackDown. Thank you. I mean, I'm not complaining about that, but... Anyways, it's it's definitely just – it's weird. I, I think Sasha deserves better. Like I have seriously was, you know, drawing up, you know, on the drawing board, her going up against Charlotte, her having a one-on-one match with Charlotte. I picked Sasha Banks to win the Royal Rumble. Therefore, in my mind, I thought she was worthy of main eventing WrestleMania one of the nights, and that obviously didn't happen. So <laughs> whatever, you know, it is what it is, but I also predicted her – to go, I mean, I, there was a backup plan, Trish Stratus, and then that clearly, mm-hmm. you know, was a pipe dream, but still, it made sense. <laughs> Would have been box office. I mean, you're bringing back Goldberg, possibly Stone Cold Steve Austin. It's going to be legends galore here. So why not get Trish on the card? But they didn't do that either. They're going to put her in a tag team match. I'm not a fan of this, but, I mean, it is what it is. I guess everybody can get the spotlight every single year. So maybe there'll be better things for Charlotte a little bit down the road. Or not Charlotte, Sasha. Maybe better things for Sasha a little bit down the road. Yeah, with this one, man, I don't, I don't know. I felt like you know, Sasha and Naomi kind of, I mean, that, that's two good competitors, not going to lie. You know, so putting them together, definitely good tag team. But, like, just the the roles that they were playing before all this, like, it, it's just not adding up on, like, what they're trying to do with them, you know. I mean, of course, like, they'd definitely be better than Carmella and Queen Selena Vega. Yeah, yeah, gosh, I almost blanked on her name just because i don't even know who the freak's holding them but yeah i mean <laughs> even well who, who was before that rhea ripley and rhea nikki and nikki ash, A-S-H. yep your favorite though. t-r-a-s-h yeah like some people <laughs> but, but yeah, uh man, I'll, it, <clears throat> oh go ahead go ahead no no i was just gonna say see like if the championships did what they were supposed to do which is elevate mm-hmm. talent make talent better then I'd be like, oh my gosh, this is a great situation. This is a good tag yeah, team. You yeah. mentioned it. Two phenomenal athletes. They both can go in the ring. Like legitimately, I don't know if there's a tag team right now. I mean, of course there's not. There's not a women's tag team division. But you could pair up two women together and it'd be tough to find a team that could beat Naomi and Sasha for those championships. So yeah, mm-hmm. if you look at it from that perspective, it's cool, you know, but if WWE didn't have such a terrible track record with those championships, I'm just like, you're just doing this to get Sasha on the show so she could have a match. You're going to put those championships on her and Naomi, and you're just going to absolutely bury them. And it, it sucks to see. I mean, it'd be cool if we got those championships on SmackDown and actually saw them get defended. But like I said, it's hard to have confidence in WWE whenever their track record is so bad with this type of stuff. But continuing on here, Drew McIntyre versus Madcap Moss. This was my lunch bowl. 
time of the show. Did you get anything from this? I know it was like supposed to be him versus Happy Corbin. They jumped in before the match and ended up being Mad Cat Moss. I don't know. I must have gotten lost there or something like that. But he hasn't gotten a chance to get his hands on Corbin just yet. But he does defeat Mad Cat Moss with an absolutely brutal, devastating Claymore. Did you catch that? Oh, uh, yeah, I did, man. This one is something that I am like uh keeping my eyes on and stuff like that. Just because Madcap, you know, I've, I've been saying this plenty of times on the show and everything like that. I'm starting to follow him a lot more. And I, I think he's just a, a great athlete, man. I'm, for him to be matching up with Drew, I mean, it's just, a, it's, it's just a good match to watch every time. So I'd rather see this than Drew and Corbin, you know. So I'm happy that it transitioned into uh, this match, you know. But I don't know. Like last week, Drew was saying that madcap would be better by himself and stuff like that i kind of feel like like that's the direction that this needs to go like this that breakup needs to happen just for madcap to strive a little bit better you know because look at who who's uh facing now you know like one of the top guys that's like good practice for you, you know so if you're on that roll already you might as well just keep rolling with it and take what comes but i don't know i'm kind of I'm, I'm ready to see him split. So, I mean, that, that's one thing I want to see here. I mean, one thing I will say, Mad Cat Moss has proven that he, like, cannot be killed. I mean, when we were in Oklahoma City, we saw he got a freaking microphone kicked at his face at, like, 50 miles an hour and absolutely, like, damn near poked his eye out. Last week, gets dropped on his head, almost breaks his freaking neck, and now he takes a claymore that almost takes his head off. I mean, this dude... I will say he's like you know that episode of Austin pa- or that movie Austin Powers. I'm not sure which one it is, but uh, have you seen the Austin Powers movies? Oh yeah, for sure. All right, for sure. So you know the one where like there's a man and the woman and it's like a dance club when they're and they're trying to kill Austin Powers and he's like dancing with this girl and he could kind of see in her reflection that somebody's behind him like trying to kill her or kill him and he oh, knows yeah, that yeah. she's trying to set him up, you know, and like she gets stabbed, she gets shot, they fall from a building and he like lands on her. And she's still alive, and he's like, why won't you die? I kind of feel like that's how Madcap is. Like, He's not going anywhere. No matter what you do to him, this dude's absolutely not going to go anywhere. But, yeah, I guess speaking of going somewhere, we can kind of move on to this next segment, the big one, the juicy one, the, uh, the contract signing for this unification match. But before we do that, I will plug Vince McMahon is going to be live in studio for the Pat McAfee show next Thursday at noon Eastern Standard Time. So 11 o'clock Central, whatever time zone you're in. Noon Eastern, Vince McMahon live in studio. I promise you, that's going to be a badass interview. You're going to see Vince McMahon probably a side you have not seen of him. Pat McAfee just has that effect on people. Go watch, go watch the Brock Lesnar interview. This dude has interviewed a lot of people that you just don't see sides of them like that. He makes them comfortable, especially whenever they're in studio. He's going to be like around the crew and all that stuff. I promise. It's going to be one of those interviews you do not want to miss. But let's go ahead and move on here. This unification match contract signing. There was security there in the ring. Clearly, if you are a enhancement talent and you are going to be the quote-unquote security for a contract signing, you know your job is to get your ass kicked that night. That's what it is. You're going to probably going to take a, a couple stiff shots. You're going to take a couple knees to the midsection. You're going to get thrown around. Hopefully, you go through the ropes smoothly. We've seen some people get thrown directly at the ropes. Absolutely not smoothly. And it looks like it hurts like hell. But we kind of come out here. Paul Heyman does his usual thing. Brock Lesnar comes out. He speaks for himself. He says, you're introducing the new or the reigning WWE World Heavyweight Champion. Similar to what Paul Heyman used to do for him back in the day. But this was kind of weird, as I will say. Because they were trying to promote this thing as the greatest match that WWE has ever seen. The greatest main event, the greatest WrestleMania match that WWE has ever seen. You watched WrestleMania 17 like a week ago. Mm -hmm. You saw Stone Cold Steve Austin Mm -hmm. versus The Rock. That is the greatest main event that WWE has ever seen in a WrestleMania main event. WrestleMania 20, the triple threat, I'd mention that one to you all the time. There's so many great matchups. Andre the Giant versus Hulk Hogan, are you kidding me? Shawn Michaels, Undertaker, I mean, how many matches have we seen? Where they've blown the roof off and it didn't need to be, we didn't need to be told, hey, this is going to be the best match of all time six weeks in advance. You know, we don't need to be told that because whenever the match happens, the wrestling tells us that the show itself tells us that the ring psychology, you know, all that good stuff. We don't need to be told 
that this is the greatest match of all time. Number one, because it's not. Honestly, it's not. We've seen it before. WrestleMania 31. Now here we are, WrestleMania 38. We're seeing the same thing. Yeah, the stakes are a little bit different. They're both different. I get their point, whereas Roman Reigns seems like he's quote unquote on God mode right now. And Brock Lesnar is Brock Lesnar. He's just always this dominant force. Nobody can beat him one on one. And if you do, like Goldberg does every now and then, he's likely going to get his revenge and beat you again. So I can see why they're promoting it as that. But, I mean, you can't just, you know, piss down my leg and tell me it's raining. You know, this isn't the greatest WrestleMania match that we're ever going to see. It's not the greatest one that we've seen. But I am behind it as, like, one of the best things that WWE has going on right now. I'm excited for this. Like I said, this segment itself, it was great. I love this. It felt like a go-home show. We saw a side of Roman Reigns with his promo where I felt like he kind of let his uh, his wings fly a little bit. We saw Paul Heyman kind of get a little bit funny, telling Brock Lesnar, we're tired of your disrespect. We saw Brock Lesnar look like he almost you know, blew the gasket a little bit, like he always does whenever he finished talking, saying that he was going to kick Roman Reigns' ass, kick Paul Heyman's ass, and you could bet your ass that he's going to get paid for it. And then he threw the microphone, signed the contract, threw that at Roman Reigns. I mean there was a lot of animosity. I could feel it coming through the TV. These are two alpha males. At the, at the heights of their career right now, kind of just meeting, winner take all. These are the two top championships. About to be one, like I mentioned earlier, not a fan of it, but either way, we're here. So we're going to analyze it. And I think that, I mean, I can see where WWE is coming from and why they want to promote it is that. But like I said, it's just, uh, it's one of those things like you, you don't say that. You know, you don't tell someone that this is going to be the greatest match. It let us decide that. You know, let the match happen and we'll tell you whether or not if it was the greatest one or not. You do, you do what you can control and that's build it. You did a damn good job today. We're five weeks out and it felt like a go home show. Hell of a segment. So if we can get more of this, like that, that's what made me excited. Like, are you kidding me? We still got five weeks to go of build up. Like, I love that. And it's just something that I can get excited about, but. I don't know. I mean, I guess I'll give you a chance to kind of, you know, speak your piece about this segment. Oh, this was freaking awesome, dude. This had me so in tune, you know. I mean, just Brock, Paul, Roman, you know, everybody just contributed so great. Even like the like security, you know, like whenever they turned on Brock, you know, they did it just in like a smooth way that like everything just like it, you knew everything was about to go bad, you know. For them guys, you know, I was just like, okay, here, here we go. Let's get this going. But the only thing I didn't like at the end of the show was just like cut off. I don't know if like a lot of yeah. people saw that. I mean, I, I mean, I wanted to see that thing like it could have been locally, like yeah, like the, the mm-hmm. listeners can be listening to this thing. What the hell are you talking about? Where they live, that it might not have happened, but I don't know. Oh, yeah, All yeah. I know is it happened to me and you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, j- just saying, you know, just my experience watching it, like you're saying, we're, we're breaking it down. We're analyzing it and stuff like that. Just, man, I wish I could have seen that thing go from start to finish, you know, just because whenever Roman started talking, you know, he started saying, you know, everybody works for him on the SmackDown side. I was like, gosh, yeah. I freaking review SmackDown, bro. I'm freaking with you. I'll stand up too, you know, like, I work so I for like, you. <laughs> Bro, that I mean, it, it just felt so great, you know, like he felt or I felt like he just like brought everybody into it, you know, so like you, you, the crowd was pumped, you know, the, the, this was just awesome build up, bro. I'm so I, I'm, I'm I'm with it. Yeah, like it was a way for Roman Reigns to kind of say, like, look around you like this isn't 2016 mm. anymore, Brock. Like, mm. look around you. I own this. Like, I am on God mode here. I cannot be touched where I am right now. Arguably, you've never been here. You never held the Universal Championship as long as I have. How long is it, John? Two or four or five forty-two. Sorry about that. Five forty-two. All right, five forty-two. All right, wasn't sure where yeah, you're going yeah. with that, but hey, five forty-two. Yeah, right, I was that's right, very... off, man. I was just, I'm, I'm just going right now. My head is just pumped for this, man. That, that that was just awesome. Just like us talking about it now. I mean, I'm replaying it in my head, and yeah, I'm, I'm ready. Hey, but go to YouTube. I'm sure you could see if you just go look at the main event for SmackDown. You could just watch like a five or ten minute video, whichever, however long that segment was. Mm-hmm. I think it might have been like 15 minutes actually. But uh, yeah, good stuff. I will say, good episode of SmackDown. Like I mentioned, felt like a go home show. If it feels like a go home show, and it's not, that's usually a good thing. Because sometimes we have go home shows, and they don't feel like that. Like oh my god, there's a pay per view here in a couple of days. Like, are you kidding me? But I feel like they did a good job here. I'm looking forward to SmackDown next oh, yeah. week without a doubt. But do you have anything else to plug here? That does do it for us here on the uh, SmackDown review. Any uh, any plugs, gonna, any shout outs? Yeah, I was going to say, I'm, I know you kind of like fast forwarded and stuff like that. So this is kind of just like a question from me to you. 
Um, you know how Sammy was, you know, making the challenge and everything like that. Did you happen to see that the that Ricochet actually stepped up? I did. I did see that okay. actually. Yeah. Yeah. I was. I was just wanting to know your opinion about that, just because you know him and Cesaro were the little tag team and everything like that. So he's kind of just throws him into like another storyline, and I'm okay with this. You know, I kind of think that he'd fit this greatly with you know the between the two. So I'm with it. Oh, those two could put on a five star match. Ricochet and Sami Zayn, 100. Yeah. percent So I'd be on board with the program there. I don't know mm-hmm. if it'll get on the card. We'll see. Like I said, two nights. You could fit eight matches on each night, so there's definitely going to be the time if uh, they want to give it to him, but I don't know. Mm-hmm. We'll see what happens. I'm on board for it, though. Ricochet is one of the more talented dudes on the entire roster, so if he gets a push, then I'm all for that, especially Sami Zayn as his dancing partner. But Even if it's not even on WrestleMania, you know, even just regular uh, SmackDown show, I'd want to see that all day. That, that was all I wanted to say yeah. about it, though. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, we still hey, we still got five weeks. You think they're not going to give you oh, some yeah. type oh, of yeah. championship match yeah, on SmackDown? You're going to get one. You got the whole month mm-hmm. of March, and the only thing I've heard of is a glorified house show as the next quote unquote pay per view or stop on the road to WrestleMania. But they're already mm-hmm. advertising so many of these matches, so you can go ahead and start uh start planning. They're already starting to announce what night they are. Roman Reigns, Brock Lesnar are going to be on night two. Charlotte Rome, or Ronda Rousey going to be on night one, and so that means Becky Lynch, Bianca Belair are going to be on night two as well. So I mean, they're starting to kind of – the card is starting to fall together. But anyways, with all that being said, I do want to thank you, John, for coming over here, hopping on this episode with me, talking about SmackDown, a great episode. I think next week has a little bit of potential to be good as well. We're on the road to WrestleMania. If these episodes aren't great, then uh, there's a little bit of a problem there. Yeah, man, I definitely want to give a shout out to you, man. Thank you for having me over and everything like that. To listeners, I mean, we still got some things going and stuff like that. Bear with us. Well, we'll definitely get that uh, historian shootout going. But oh, yeah. yeah, just give us some time. So waiting on Mike to get the times and stuff updated, but we'll get it rolling. Yeah, I've, I've been contacting the participants. We've kind of been oh, in yeah. communication oh, yeah. here. It's a little tough, but we're starting to kind of it's starting to kind of come together. Like I could see the yeah. vision. In my head of these matchups starting to starting to actually shape up, and this wasn't necessarily like a sprint. It was more like a uh, a relay, so to speak, or mm-hmm. a, what is it? Marathon. That's the word I was looking for. It's there not a go. sprint. There it's a go. marathon. It's a big picture here. It's gonna take a little bit of time. You, that was just like the groundwork. We're starting to get the participants, but it's gonna happen. It's gonna be some damn good content. So, with all that being said, guys, thank you so much for listening. Check out all the other shows here on the WWE podcast. I promise you will not regret it. Hope you guys all have a damn good weekend. Walk passionately in the direction of your dreams, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the WWE Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss a show. Or head to WWEPodcast.com. And for all of these shows ad-free, head over to Patreon.com slash WWEPodcast. Until then, we'll see you next time.